I welcome Dr. Carlos on behalf of our nice committee. Yeah, hello. Hello, welcome, Professor. We will start our session within two minutes. Welcome, Professor. And we will start the session in two minutes. OK, thank you. Now I request Dr. J. Nitya, Professor, Department of Information Technology, K.S. Rangasamy College of Technology to introduce our today's keynote speaker. Pleasant morning to all. I'm happy to introduce the keynote speaker of today's session, Professor Carlos. He received a PhD in computer science from Tulane University USA in 1996. His res research has mainly focused on the design of uh, new multi objective optimization algorithms based on bio inspired algorithms. He currently has more than 500 publications, including more than 160 journal papers and 50 book chapters. He has published a monographic book and has edited three more books with publishers such as Old Scientific and Springer. He has supervised 20 PhD thesis and 48 master thesis. He has also received several best paper awards at different international conferences. He is also the only Latin American who has been awarded the Outstanding Paper Award in the IEEE transactions on evolutionary computation. His publications currently report nearly 60,000 citations in Google Scholar. His H index is 94. He has received several awards, including the National Research Award from the Mixing and Academy of Science. And in 2009, he received a medal to the scientific merit from Mexico City's Congress. And in 2011, Heberto Castillo Award for scientists under the age of 45 in basic science. And in 2012, Scopus Award for being the most highly cited scientist in engineering. And in 2012, again, National Medal of Science in Physics, Mathematics and Natural Sciences from Mexico's presidency. He has also received the Luis Elizondo Award from the Tecnologico de Monterrey in 2019. Additionally, he is a recipient of the 2013 IEEE Kyo Tomiyasu Award for pioneering contributions to single and multi-objective optimization techniques using bio-inspired algorithms. He is currently the editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Evolutionary Computation. He is full professor with distinction at the Computer Science Department of Sinvestov IPN in Mexico City, Mexico. We are privileged to have such an eminent per person for our session. Welcome you, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation and for the introduction, so let me uh, share my screen. I think you should be able to see my screen in there. 
Okay. Uh, my talk is uh, about a field in which I have been working for a long time, since 1994. And uh, it's an area that has had uh, a very important growth, particularly I will say in the last 15 years or so. It's called evolutionary multi-objective optimization. So for uh, talking about uh, evolutionary multi-objective optimization, I need to start by defining what multi-objective optimization is in general. Then I will briefly talk about evolutionary algorithms and why the evolutionary algorithms are suitable for multi-objective optimization problems. Okay, so first, uh, multi-objective optimization refers to solving optimization problems in which instead of having a single objective, we have two or more objectives that we aim to, to optimize simultaneously. However, these problems have uh, a peculiarity. At least some of these objectives are conflicting among each other. So that means that improving one will worsen at least another objective. This is an example in engineering. Let's say I want to design a bridge. Two obvious objectives will be to minimize the cost and maximize safety. However, these two objectives are conflicting because if I want to increase the safety of the bridge, normally I have to increase the concrete and the steel, which of course will increase the cost. Also, if I want to do the opposite, I want to decrease the cost, I have to, to build a lighter uh, bridge, which means I will have to remove some concrete to remove some steel, and this will sacrifice safety. So these problems are really, in mathematical terms, are ill-defined because there is no single solution for them. Normally, like in the old days in engineering, uh, many people solve these problems by transforming uh, some of the objectives, except all of the objectives except for one into constraints, and then optimizing only the most important objective subject to a set of constraints. However, this is not appropriate because an objective is not the same as a constraint. A constraint is, is basically a value that I don't want to exceed or for, for which I need a minimum value, whereas an objective is a magnitude, a value that I want to minimize or I want to maximize. Mathematically, this is the definition of a multi-objective optimization problem. I have k objective functions that I'm trying to optimize, and perhaps these objectives are subject to constraints, either inequality or equality constraints, or both. The first issue in multi-objective optimization is the notion of optimality. Unlike global optimization, in which the notion of global optimum is, is very obvious, in the case of multi-objective optimization, uh, it's not so obvious to know what will be the optimum or the best possible solution. So the notion that uh, we normally use today was originally proposed by Francis Isidro Edgeworth. He was an economist at Oxford University, and he introduced this notion in his book, Mathematical Psychics, that was published in the year 1881. This notion of optimality refers to finding the best possible trade-off or compromise among conflicting objectives. He was, in his definition, referring only to problems having two objectives. However, it was the Italian economist, Vilfredo Pareto, who in 1896 published a book called Cours d'Economie, it's a book in French, in which he generalizes this notion However, he was not aware of Edgeworth's uh, contribution. He came up with his own definition in a more general sense, and he called this notion of the best trade-off or the best compromise solution, he called it of a limit. This notion is known today as the Edgeworth Pareto or simply the Pareto Optimum or Pareto Optimality. What is the definition of Pareto Optimality? It's very simple. If we assume that all the objectives are being minimized, and this is a reasonable assumption because it's always possible to transform a maximization into a minimization, then we say that a vector of decision variables which satisfies all the constraints, that's what this part means, is feasible, 
is Pareto optimal if there does not exist another feasible solution such that these conditions hold, is less equal in every objective and strictly less in at least one of them. There are variations of Pareto optimality. For example, if I remove the, the first condition, the less equal, keep only the second. This is called a strong Pareto optimality, and it produces less solutions than Pareto optimality. If I do the opposite, I remove the second and keep only the first. This is called weak optimality and produces more solutions than Pareto optimality. In words, the definition of Pareto optimality basically says that a solution is said to be Pareto optimal if it's not possible to improve one objective without worsening at least another one. Because of the conflicting nature of the objectives, this definition will produce a set of solutions, not a single solution. This set of solutions defined in decision variable space is called the Pareto optimal set. The vectors corresponding to the solutions, including the Pareto optimal set, are called non-dominated, and the image of the Pareto optimal set is called the Pareto flow. Uh, Multi-objective optimization became uh, a research area within operations research in the 1970s. Since then, a wide variety of mathematical programming techniques have been developed to solve different types of multi-objective optimization problems. If we focus simply on uh, nonlinear multi-objective optimization problems, uh, we can say there are about 30 different families of algorithms available for, uh, for solving nonlinear multi-objective optimization problems. But these algorithms have uh, some limitations, some, um, I would say, disadvantages. The main ones are related to two, two things. First, these algorithms, whenever they are executed, they require an initial starting point, and the solution they generate is normally not very far from the original uh, point that is provided to the algorithm. Also, they rely a lot on the uh, mathematical properties of the objectives that are being optimized. That is to say that many of these methods don't work when the Pareto front is disconnected, for example, or when, uh, when there are discontinuities where the objective function is not differentiable. So they are limited in, in, the, in their usability. Now, in general, mathematical programming techniques offer an advantage. The advantage is they are very fast. These, these techniques are very fast in terms of computational time. Now, here comes the use of evolutionary algorithms. Evolutionary algorithms are techniques, that they are stochastic search techniques that are inspired on the principle of natural selection from Charles Darwin, the so-called survival of the fetus, and basically what they do is to simulate an evolutionary process using a set of solutions, which is our population, which is subject to a selection mechanism, some operators, normally crossover and mutation, and over a number of iterations that we call generations, they produce an approximation of the optimum. There are different types of evolutionary algorithms from, from which the three main ones are Genetic algorithms that were proposed by John Holland in the 1960s, uh, evolution strategies that were proposed by Ingo Rehenberg and Hans Paul Schwefel back also in the 60s, in the 1960s, and evolutionary programming that was proposed by Lawrence Fogel also in the 1960s. Evolutionary algorithms operate on a set of solutions, which we call population. Initially, this set of, so this set of solutions is generated randomly. This is done only at the very beginning of the search. Each member of the population encodes all the decision variables of the problem. And in order to know how good a particular individual is with respect to the others, that means the how fit it is, we need to compute something called a fitness function. The fitness function is defined in terms of the objective function However, the objective function is normally normalized 
to make sure that the fitness values are, for example, always positive and greater than zero. Individuals with the highest fitness have a higher probability of being selected to become parents. Those individuals that are selected are recombined. We have an operator called crossover and the children or the offspring of these uh, parents are mutated. Mutation is an operator that produces small changes in the structure of the individual. We repeat this process during a certain number of iterations that we call generations, and this is pretty much the way in which an evolutionary algorithm works. Now, evolutionary algorithms are particularly suitable for multi-objective optimization uh, due to several reasons. The main ones are that evolutionary algorithms operate on a set of solutions, not with one solution at a time, as is the case of mathematical programming techniques. Because of that, if we properly manipulate the population of an evolutionary algorithm, it should be possible to generate several elements of the Pareto optimal set in a single execution of the algorithm. This is not possible with mathematical programming techniques. The other advantage is that evolutionary algorithms as optimizers are much more general uh, techniques. That means they are less susceptible to the shape and the continuity of the Pareto, which is not the case of mathematical programming techniques. Over the years, evolutionary algorithms have been used to solve multi-objective optimization problems of different degrees of difficulty. Research in this area started long time ago in 1985 with the development of BEGA, the Vector Evaluated Genetic Algorithm. And after BEGA, a number of other approaches were proposed. Some of them were very simple, very naive algorithms uh, in the old days that goes from the mid 1980s to early 1990s. We have approaches which are non elitist and non Pareto based. This means they don't use the concept of Pareto optimality in the selection mechanism, and they don't retain the non-dominated solutions generated by, by the algorithm. So we have techniques like lexicographic ordering, which is very simple in lexicographic ordering. We define a priority for the objectives and we optimize first the most important objective. Once we can no longer improve a sol the solution uh, for the best, uh, for the most important objective, we try to optimize the second objective in importance, but without losing the solution we already found for the most important one. And we keep doing this until all the objectives had, had been considered. Linear aggregating functions basically consist in adding up all the objectives to produce a scalar optimization problem, which is of course easier to solve. By using weights for each of the objectives, it's possible to generate different solutions. Uh, Vega is, is a population-based approach. Basically, what it does is to split the population into as many subpopulations as objectives we have. And in each subpopulation, only the best solutions with respect to one objective are selected. So subpopulation one, for example, in, in that one, we will select only the best solutions with respect to objective one. Subpopulation two, the uh, best solutions with respect to objective two, and so on. And then when performing crossover, we will force recombination of individuals in subpopulation one with individuals in subpopulation two, with the aim of producing solutions that represent a good trade off. The epsilon constraint method is, is a transformation method. It transforms a multi objective optimization problem into several single objective optimization problems that have to be solved sequentially. <clears throat> Target vector approaches, these are, these are non-linear aggregating functions in which instead of trying to add up all the objectives, we compute differences between the objective function values that we have and the target values that we wish to achieve for each objective. Uh, so these methods offer some advantages over linear aggregating functions because they are more general, but they have the disadvantage that they are susceptible to the target values. Knowing the target values implies some very specific knowledge about the, uh, the problem that we are trying to solve.
which is not always uh, available. From the early 90s to the mid 90s, a variety of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms that use already the concept of Pareto optimality were developed. The main ones started with uh, the idea of using what is called Pareto ranking or non-dominated sorting that was introduced in David Goldberg's uh, book on genetic algorithms in 1999. From that idea, three main algorithms were developed. MOGA, the multi-objective genetic algorithm, introduced by Carlos Fonseca in 1993. The non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm introduced by Kalja Muidev in the year 1994. And the niche Pareto genetic algorithm proposed by Jeffrey Horn also in 1994. These algorithms are better than those from the previous uh, stage in the sense that they are more sophisticated, they have more mechanisms. However, they are still relatively naive. They are still non elitist They don't retain the best solutions they produce. And they, the source code of these approaches also is not steadily available. It's, some of them have the code available, others don't, don't have it. Then from the late 90s to the early 2000s, there is this big explosion of new approaches. These algorithms are not only based on Pareto optimality, but they are also elites. That means the uh, non-dominant solutions generated by the algorithm are retained in a data structure that we call the secondary population or the external archive. The use of this structure is important, uh, mainly for theoretical reasons. So we have, for example, the strain Pareto evolutionary algorithm that was proposed by Eckhart Sitzler in 1998, although the journal version was published in the year 99. The NSGA2, non-dominant sorting genetic algorithm 2, that was proposed by Kaljo Moidev in the year 2000, but the journal version was published in the year 2002. Then we have many others like the Pareto archive evolutionary algorithm, the Pareto envelope based uh, algorithm, and so on the microgenetic algorithm for multi-objective optimization, and many, many others. Many of these algorithms have been already forgotten, but the main advantage for most of these algorithms is that their source code was available in the public domain. Then we have what I call the recent approaches that were developed after uh, the year 2000. So we have, for example, Moyadi. Moyadi, Moyadi means multi-objective evolutionary algorithm based on decomposition. This is an interesting idea. I will talk about this in another slide. We have another family of algorithms called indicator-based approaches, and we have algorithms like SMSIMOA, HYPE, uh, and the indicator-based evolutionary algorithm. Uh, this is another intriguing idea because indicator-based approaches are based on the notion that we can optimize a performance indicator instead of using Pareto optimality. And finally, we have NSGA3, which was proposed in the year 2014, and, uh, and it became uh, a reference approach that many people try to improve or to use to compare results, uh, although from an algorithmic perspective, it doesn't really introduce any, any new ideas in terms of design. So in general, modern multi-objective evolutionary algorithms consist of two basic components. We have a selection mechanism that normally, but not necessarily, incorporates Pareto optimality. I say not necessarily because, as I mentioned before, it's possible to use a performance indicator instead of Pareto optimality. The second component is a mechanism that we call a density estimator. A density estimator is responsible for maintaining diversity in the population, which means it, it keeps the algorithm from converging to a single solution. This is a very, very important mechanism that is present in every modern multi-objective evolutionary algorithm that we, that we use today. Now, regarding algorithms, there are three main types of multi-objective evolutionary algorithm in current use. The so-called Pareto-based, decomposition-based, and indicator-based. Very briefly, I, I will describe each of these three families. We we'll start with Pareto-based. These are the traditional, like the old multi-objective evolutionary algorithms in which the selection mechanism is based on Pareto optimality. 
Most of them adopt something that we call Pareto ranking or non-dominated sorting, and they adopt a density estimator, and there are a variety of choices for this. For example, in the old days, in the 90s, people use a lot something called fitness sharing. NSGA2 uses something crowding. Other algorithms have used entropy, adapted grids, parallel coordinates, and so on. The main limitations of Pareto-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms has to do with scalability, scalability in objective function space. These algorithms don't scale properly because as we increase the number of objectives, very quickly, the number of non-dominated solutions grows. Actually, this growth is exponential. This means that very quickly, if we don't increase the population size exponentially, every solution in the population will become non-dominated. If this happens, this is very bad because that means that we are selecting randomly. We are no longer selecting based on Pareto optimality because everybody is equally good. So the problem of scalability in the old days, people thought will happen starting in 10 objectives or more. However, the problem starts with more than three objectives. It starts in four objectives. These are the so-called many objective optimization problems. It is possible to use a density estimator to deal with the scalability problem, although many researchers don't like to go for this choice. Second family, decomposition-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. This is uh, an interesting and intriguing idea. In here, the, the idea is I'm going to transform a multi-objective optimization problem into several single objective optimization problems that are going to be solved simultaneously using neighborhood search. So these algorithms require something that we call a scalarizing function. The scalarizing function defines search directions and we need weights to uh, sort of indicate where these search directions are. So these algorithms are very powerful, are very efficient, they're very fast. They have the advantage that they can scale on the number of objectives, although they require more weights, but the increase of weights is linear with the number of objectives, it's not exponential, so this is, this is good. However, the main limitation of decomposition-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms has to do with the scalarizing functions that are normally adopted with them. Because of their nature, these scalarizing functions are designed for Pareto fronts that fit into a simplex. So this means that if the Pareto front doesn't have a geometrical shape that corresponds to that of a simplex, then these algorithms are no longer effective. And it's actually very easy to show this because if you take a traditional Pareto front of a benchmark problem and you just, and, and you just propose to solve the inverted version of the Pareto front, the algorithm doesn't work anymore. Finally, the third family, indicator-based multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. This is another intriguing idea. The notion here that was introduced by Sitzler is that it should be possible to use a performance indicator instead of using Pareto optimality. If we could find a performance indicator with the proper mathematical properties. It turns out we only know one performance indicator that has the mathematical properties that are required. This indicator is called hypervolume, and it, it works very nicely because it's strictly monotonic with, uh, with respect to Pareto optimality, which is what we want. However, the problem of the hypervolume is its high computational cost. The computational cost of the hypervolume increases polynomially on the number of points, but exponentially on the number of objectives. This is very bad because very quickly it becomes unaffordable in terms of computational time to compute exact hypervolume values. There are other options, other indicators which are not fully Pareto compliant, they are weakly Pareto compliant, and in some cases they produce reasonably good results in most cases, for example, R2, but most researchers, for different reasons, don't, don't seem to like them too much. Regarding density estimators, I already mentioned this concept. 
the, this is a component that is used to uh, allow uh, to maintain diversity in the population. We want to generate solutions that are different so that we can produce several elements of the Pareto optimal set in a single run. There are many options going from fitness sharing, clustering has been used also, entropy, adapted grids, crowding, performance indicators, social the hyper volume, and parallel coordinates. Some of these performance indicators are not scalable. For example, adapted grids were originally proposed only for two objectives. Crowding was also proposed only for two objectives. Others, however, like performance indicators, parallel coordinates, fitness sharing or clustering are scalable. They can be used with any number of objectives. This graph, which is not up to date, we're still working on this, it was because of the pandemic, shows the number of papers published per year on EMO, on evolutionary multi-objective optimization. Then it's a very interesting graph because you can see the very beginning of the field in 1985, with the first uh, two papers from David Chafer, 1984, he published his PhD thesis. And then you can see for several years, the field remained pretty much unexplored. The first survey on IMO was published in the year 95, was published by Carlos Fonseca. I published the second survey in the year 99. I got my PhD in 96. So still at 99, you can see the, uh, the bar is not too high. However, it started to increase very quickly. And one day I woke up and everybody was working on IMU. So you can see these peaks of more than 1,000 papers in a single year. If you look at the evolution of the graph, and some people uh, may ask the question, if the number of publications has decreased in the last 10 years or so, the answer is no, it hasn't decreased. What has decreased is the time I have available to update the graph. The number of publications is still very, very high on him. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, very quickly, I will mention a few of the many real world applications that are currently available of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, just to give you an idea of the sort of things that people have been working on. So we'll start with this one in architecture. It's a very interesting application. Van der Blom et al. in the Netherlands developed an approach that was able to learn heuristic rules on building a special design. And the way they did it was quite interesting. They applied data mining to results obtained by a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. In other words, they allow a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm to propose several solutions and they try to learn from these solutions so that they could gain insights that they could provide to an architect to build better special designs regarding thermal and structural performance. So they were trying to learn from the solutions produced by the multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. So this is actually a very, very interesting uh, application. Gabrera et al. in the United Kingdom, they adopted a local search procedure and a multi-objective metaheuristic to optimize the intensity modulated radiation therapy for cancer treatment. Uh, when this is treated as a multi-objective optimization problem, the idea is to lead to a set of dose distributions that, depending on both dose prescription and physician preferences, can be selected as the preferred treatment for a patient. Uh, again, they, they use real data for, for, this, uh, for this paper. This is an application from China. Xiao et al., they propose an extension of Moia D. This is one of the algorithms I mentioned in my talk, which is based on reference distance, and they use this to solve software project portfolio optimization problems. This is actually a very interesting application because uh, software companies normally have a large number of projects each year, and they have a limited budget, so they cannot uh, finance all of these projects. So the idea is to select the projects that are going to get funding in a particular year with the objective of maximizing return under a high number of constraints and, of course, limited resources, because the company doesn't have lots of money to, to fund all the projects. Another application from Kayan et al., they provide a review of concepts on machine learning techniques that can deal with modeling big or limited data 
and they present uh, a case study related to the use of a hybrid algorithm for an industry 4.0 application with limited data. Basically, the idea is uh, to develop an intelligent algorithm for robust data modeling of nonlinear systems based on input-output data. And the algorithm they present, this intelligent algorithm, is actually a multi-objective genetic algorithm, which is used to design the topology of the neural network that is adopted by the authors to uh, and also to overcome uh, overfeeding. Overfeeding is a common problem that occurs when training neural networks. Gotti et al. They use uh, a multi-objective genetic algorithm to simultaneously optimize costs and benefits of condition-based maintenance. The idea here is to determine the optimal values of preventive intervention limits for equipment under corrective and preventive maintenance uh, cost criteria. And they use as a case study uh, an optimization problem that consists of three continuously monitored components of a simplified injection system. Uh, some of the research representative of the current trends of what people are doing these days. Uh, there are several research areas in this uh, within this topic. I won't get into the details, of course, due to the limited time I have. But for example, one of the hot areas is uh, what we call many objective optimization. This refers to solving multi-objective optimization problems having four or more objectives. The idea here is to solve these problems efficiently and effectively. That means with uh, algorithms that are fast and produce good solutions. Hybrids are also still uh, an open research area. The hybrids that most people consider are combinations of multi-objective evolutionary algorithms and mathematical priming techniques, for example, hybridizing NSGA2 with a gradient-based method. Uh, another interesting area is the use of surrogate and parallel methods to deal with expensive objective functions. This is because in some domains, for example, in aeronautical engineering, the objective functions involved are computationally expensive. It could take hours, days, or even months to, uh, to evaluate some of these objectives because uh, we need to use some uh, simulators to to compute the values of the objectives. So in this case, the main alternatives are either to use surrogates, because surrogates uh, provide an approximation of the actual objective function. And we can run many simulations on the surrogate, which is, of course, cheaper to evaluate than the original objective, but it has an error. So after performing a certain number of evaluations on this surrogate, we have to go back to the to the model and make a correction to try to reduce the error. Surrogate methods are, are very nice in engineering, but they are normally limited by the dimensionality of the problem. Most of them work only with a low number of objectives. The other possibility is to use parallelism. We can use clusters of computers or GPU computing, whatever resources you have available to parallelize the execution of the algorithms used in these uh, computationally expensive problems. However, this implies different uh, programming techniques and is also a non-trivial exercise. It, it requires redesigning completely the, uh, the algorithms. People are still developing applications, of course, in many domains, bioinformatics, medicine, operating systems, physics, chemistry, you name it, in, in many, many different areas. Other topics that are more specialized is, for example, solving the so-called multimodal, multi-objective optimization problems. These are problems in which there are different sets of Pareto optimal solutions that correspond to the same Pareto front. So we try to find several of these different sets uh, rather than finding a single one. So this makes the problem more difficult because we are trying to maintain diversity both in decision variable space and in objective function space. Normally, we only worry about keeping diversity in one space, which is normally objective function space. Some of the challenges, there are still quite a few challenges in this field. 
For example, can we combine different operators and algorithmic components to produce tailored and highly competitive multi-objective evolutionary algorithms? In other words, can a computer design without any human intervention an efficient and effective multi-objective evolutionary algorithm by combining components? This is an open question. Some people believe this is possible, others hope it's not. You know, if, if you design algorithms for a living, you are expecting this to be a reality perhaps after you die, but not during your living time. Can we design selection mechanisms for multi-objective evolutionary algorithms different from the ones currently available? Some of us believe it is possible to come up with a different paradigm, but so far nobody has found any, any new paradigm besides the three that I already mentioned, Pareto base, the decomposition base, and indicator base. Another question is, can we design better density estimators and performance indicators for many objective optimization problems? This is an interesting question because when we deal with a high dimensionality, <coughs> everything becomes difficult. Assessing performance becomes difficult. There are few performance indicators for, for those problems. And also designing a good density estimator is difficult because most density estimators were really designed for low dimensionality. Other, another interesting topic is the development of techniques for large-scale multi-objective optimization problems. By large-scale, I mean problems having 100 or more decision variables, all the way to 5,000 or even 10,000 or more decision variables. The most common approach so far is the use of the so-called cooperative uh, coevolutionary algorithms. But there are other approaches that are possible for, for these uh, large-scale multi-objective optimization problems, but uh, this is still research uh, in progress, we could say. Another topic is the design of uh, multi-objective hyperheuristics for continuous optimization. Hyperheuristics are techniques that combine different uh, heuristics into a single uh, algorithmic framework using a control system that decides when to use a particular heuristic and for how long. So the idea is to provide a more general optimizer by combining heuristics of a different nature, heuristics that are somehow complementary to each other. That's the idea of hyperheuristics. Uh, these techniques were originally designed for combinatorial optimization, but over the years, they have been extended to continuous optimization to problems in which the decision variables are real numbers. If you want to know more about this topic, you are welcome to visit the EMO repository. This is the, the link, the web page. You will find there a large number of bibliographic references. We're close to 13,000. This includes more than 300 PhD theses and a high number of journal and conference papers. We also have contact information of an important number of EMO researchers, and more important, we have code. We have source code available in the public domain for a wide number of algorithms. We also have platforms like PlatEMO that is implemented in MATLAB and contains more than 100 algorithms implemented. We have other platforms available in Java, in Python, in C, in C++, in different programming languages, and all of these are free to use and, uh, and are available for anyone, anyone who is interested in this topic. That's all from my side. Thank you again for the invitation, and I open to any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor, for your affirmative speech about the emails. Any questions? Participants can unmute your mic and raise your questions. Good morning, Professor. This is Tamil Shelby from ECE. Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, you have told that compared to the ma mathematical optimization techniques, the Pareto optimization techniques will help to evaluate some several elements, few 
which could not be done by a mathematical optimization technique. Am I right, sir? What I said is they offer advantages with respect to mathematical programming techniques because they, they are more general. They are less uh, susceptible, for example, to the sort of definition of the objectives. If the objectives are uh, highly nonlinear, for example, evolutionary algorithms will normally work, whereas some mathematical programming techniques won't work in those cases. So they are more general. Okay. And you have also mentioned that the few methods for estimating that uh, several elements using that Pareto optimizations. In that you have indicated that uh, uh, entropy, clustering, fitness, everything, right, sir? So these yeah. uh, these uh, techniques uh, could be implemented by a basing ML algorithms, right? So then what is the specialty in estimating this using Pareto estimator? Well, uh, density estimators are not based on Pareto optimality. Density estimators, what they do is they keep the algorithm from converging to a single solution. So they ensure what we call diversity. Diversity means to keep solutions that are different from each other. Several solutions that are good in terms of uh, Pareto optimality, but they are different in terms of decision variable values. So the density estimators are applied normally based on how similar solutions are. They, they try to make solutions dissimilar. So they are defining decision variable space. Pareto optimality is defining objective function space. So density estimators are a complement to Pareto optimality. OK, sir. Thank you, sir. Hmm? Sir, I have one question, sir. Sir, what is the key difference between single objective evolutionary algorithms and multi-objective evolutionary algorithms, sir? Uh, well, in, in single objective, you are trying to find a single solution, right? The global optimum is the best possible solution in the whole search space. In multi-objective optimization, we obtain a set of solutions, not only one, it's several solutions, all of which are equally good. So multi-objective optimization is more difficult in that sense. It's a, it's a more difficult optimization problem. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. Other participants, uh, if you have any doubts or queries, please raise your hand. We will enable your mic. Thank you, sir. Uh, today we had a uh, good opportunity to hear your informative speech, sir. And this will surely be going to encourage our encourage us in our future, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. The session officially ends. The participants are requested to join in the respective session by 11.30 a.m.